Today's topic is DNA and family history research. If you have a question or a family history success story you would like to see, uh, or have us see, you can email it to us at questionsandancestors at byu.edu, or you can visit our website at www.ancestors.com, where you will be able to find a way to contact us. And today we have with us to talk about DNA Dr. Scott Woodward, who is the director of the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation. It's nice to have you here, Scott. It's nice to be here to be able to talk about this topic today. It seems like DNA testing seems to be coming much more popular in the genealogy world these days. Um, our first question it has to deal with this topic. It says, it was, it's from Hannah Katz, I believe is how you pronounce her name. She says, I read where they traced the Y chromosome of Thomas Jefferson back to Phoenicia. So he was actually semantic, semantic at least along his paternal line. Are people of Western European ancestry actually semantic as well? Since the early church was heavily Jewish, it would seem that they were all in possession of Jewish genes if you go back far enough. How would you respond to that? That's an, that's an excellent question to point out both um, the, the uses of DNA in genealogical research and also some of the limitations and make sure that we have the expectations correct about what DNA can do for genealogical work. Um, it's not surprising that Thomas Jefferson may have some connections with what some people would call Semitic DNA uh, in, uh, through, through Phoenicia. Uh, all of us um, will tie back to common ancestors sometime in the distant past. And, and that's really what we're talking about here, our distance, distant past. Uh, usually when we're dealing with geneal genealogical questions, we're asking questions about the last four or eight or maybe ten generations. I mean, we really want to know something about our great-great-grandparents, something like that. DNA can help us very strongly uh, in, in those time periods and be able to give us some very accurate results. When we start getting back as deep as, uh, as the Phoenician times and uh, two and three and four thousand years in the past, it starts to clump a lot of different people together in the same groups. People that we wouldn't necessarily think today by looking at them would belong to the same same groups. But in reality, uh, Darius and I, even though if you looked at us, you wouldn't think that we had a very common ancestor. Uh, just, just you're, you're taller. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I think that's it. Uh, although I have just about as much gray hair. Uh -huh. So... Uh, <clears throat> But the reality is we could find a common ancestor between the two of us, not only on our Y chromosome, but in a lot of the other DNA that we carry with us. And so it becomes a question of where do you want to draw the line? How far back do you want to go uh, to look for those common ancestors? Darius and I probably don't have a common ancestor within the last four or five or six, eight generations. But by the time we get back to maybe 15 or 20 generations, even that close, we probably do have common ancestors. And so uh, DNA can look at all of those levels. It can look at the very close levels, last two, three, four, eight generations. It can also look at the very deep relationships that we have. And it just, um, DNA can be used to look at both of those levels. So you're involved with the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Research Project. What is that? We are working very hard to build the world's most comprehensive genetic and genealogical database. This is a database that will take both genetic information, information that all of us have, and correlate it with genealogical information, information that only some of us have, and use that information to help people who don't have that genealogical information understand something about who they are and how they are connected to the rest of the world. Let's let's give an example. Let's use me. I understand that you like to have someone who has a um, four or five generation genealogical history, and you plug that in, and then you take a, a swab, I believe a cheek swab, and get my genetic information. And how is that used? How 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 does that connect us to others? The first part of this process is actually building the database, and the database contains both the genetic information that we get from your DNA. We currently get that DNA by uh, actually a mouthwash, which is a very... Uh, when we started this project, we used a blood sample, and so we had to actually poke you with a needle and take a blood sample. That's why I never did it. And, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad and it's progressed. Although, you know, we did have 20,000 people 
participate uh, in the time that we were using uh, blood samples. But we, we, we progressed beyond the barbaric stage, <laughs> and now what we use is a mouthwash, which is actually quite pleasant. Uh, you just put the mouthwash in, you swish it around for about 45 seconds, and put that back in the bottle, and we extract DNA from that mouthwash. We then test that DNA for hundreds of genetic markers and put that information in a database. That same person that gave us the DNA will also give us genealogical information, four, five, six generations of complete genealogical information. That goes into the genealogy side of the database. Now, we bring those two together to, to be able to associate specific patterns of genes with specific genealogies. And that becomes the database. And, and now what happens is a person who doesn't know much about their genealogy or would like to be connected with someone would obtain, essentially independent from, from our database, a genetic signature of themselves. And there are a number of commercial companies out there where they can obtain that particular uh, signature. They would then bring that signature to our website and plug those values in to a search program on our website, which is free. Mm -hmm. And that would give them back information about who they are most closely related to in the website in, or in the database mm -hmm. and, uh, and give them a start. Someplace, sometimes they'll find, they'll find ancestors that they are 100% related to within the last four or five or six generations. Other times they'll find people that uh, they may be related to, but it's deeper. It may be 10 or 12 or maybe 18 generations in the past. It'll show a common ancestor between the two people. Will it give a name? It, it will if, if the person who had submitted the DNA sample to the database has genealogy deep enough. Okay. okay. And if there isn't a name provided, it will just say that there is some individual? There is some individual eight or that, 10 generations back. that you share in common. There's a common ancestor someplace back in the past with this person who is living today. And then the two of you get together and you figure out how are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to find that common ancestor that, that the two of us have? I have a question about the database and the genealogies mm -hmm. that are submitted. Um, do you go through any correction or, or, or checking of the sources? Do you require sources to be provided with the information? How do you guarantee that the genealogies are accurate? But, uh, that's an excellent question. As, as a professional genealogist, you're keenly aware of the problems associated with the circulating genealogies that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in my case, I know of uh, four or five separate editions of my own personal genealogy that have been compiled by different members of the family, and they conflict with each other. Aunt Martha's is different than Aunt Mary's, and, mm -hmm. and there's some pretty big battles at family reunions <laughs> trying to decide who is most correct. We have a staff of professional genealogists that work with us on the, on, on the, on the project. Uh, they spend a considerable amount of time first screening the genealogies as they come in for the, for obvious errors, mm -hmm. uh, people being born uh, before their parents were born, uh, other things like that. Uh, there are filters that all of our data go through that we've built, algorithms that that need to be qualified. These genealogies mm -hmm. need to be qualified. We don't necessarily require sources uh, originally, but all of all of the genealogies that go into the database are examined by professional genealogists. Where sources can be located, they are put in, and they're, uh, they're added to it. In some cases, uh, genealogies are not accepted into the database because of obvious errors. Mm -hmm. okay. And so uh, there are ways that we like to think that our database is, uh, we're working very hard to make it as accurate as possible.